the British Transport Police began surveillance of the youth club. Five officers worked for a year, photographing tags on illegal paintings and matching them up with murals at Barton Hill. It was the beginning of Operation Anderson. From a police point of view, um, we have a, a very few options open to us. I mean, we, whilst individually we might like to encourage them to work elsewhere, um, if offences are reported to us, obviously we have to respond to that. And I think if, if the, the same situation appears again, we would probably take a similar course of action. The police have a number of options when they attempt to control this sort of behaviour. They can prosecute for serious offences, they can prosecute for relatively low level offences, for minor offences, and they can also not prosecute at all. They don't necessarily have to use the criminal law in this way. They have a fairly wide discretion. And I think one of the questions here is whether, as some criminologists have suggested, that um, vandalism of this kind can be perhaps channeled in different ways, in more expressive ways. On the 12th of July, 1989, the British Transport Police raided the houses of the 12 sprayers and taggers they were certain they could convict. It's all the worst we've ever heard. It's basically is when we actually got to go into the court and stand in the dock. Okay, would you come this way, please, sir? And especially for what we actually did, it wasn't really that. The way they treated us was as if we were some big sort of bank robbers or something. If you'd like to take a seat over there, please. Okay, sit down. Okay, I'd like to give you this notice as to why you've been detained at the uh, police station. Uh, just point out to you, they have the right to have someone informed of your arrest. You have the right to consult a solicitor. And you have a right to consult a copy of the codes of practice. And you can do this now or at any time during the interview. Okay? I'll give you that notice there. Right, if we can just start then on the interview. They seized sackloads of spray cans, marker pens, and design books. But the most important thing they seized was a diary which contained the telephone numbers of nearly 50 sprayers. Over the next two weeks, they were arrested in the biggest ever hall of graffiti artists and equipment. We had a large number of, of offences uh, committed all over the city, a large number committed on, on the railway stations and on trains. We the master. Uh, uh, terrific amount of, of evidence, but it all had to be pieced together and documented, and evidence against all the individuals had to be carefully examined to make sure that we had sufficient evidence to proceed against the individuals. Cataloguing an unexpected mass of evidence was difficult. So difficult that the chief prosecuting solicitor had to spend two weeks sorting it himself. Very conclusive evidence here, isn't it? Yeah. This is really good stuff, this. It's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's all the rubbish you see just on the side of the building. Defence solicitors believe confusion over the evidence all but crippled the police case. They say that's why the Crown Prosecution Service asked for a more straightforward mass trial. Bristol magistrates turned them down and tried all but five cases themselves. That they were trying to prove some grand type of conspiracy they then found out that the evidence that they had certainly wasn't sufficient for anything like that and had to think again. But it took them a long time to actually reach that stage. It, it went through most of the magistrates' court proceedings, as I recall. They were all linked up together in one big bunch, which made it very, very difficult to actually isolate each defendant, what each defendant was supposed to have done. Each of the 46 sprayers convicted over the next six months was found guilty of less serious charges than the police had brought. Their fines ranged from £20 to £2,000. The last and most serious case to come to court was youth leader John Nation. The police alleged he'd organised all those convicted. Nation says he expected the prosecution. I knew that I would come into contact with the police because of the fact that this site had tags that appeared on it, that appeared on illegal work outside, and obviously the police formed the link between myself and the project here, and work that was going on illegally. But obviously, if I was to attract those young people from illegal nature, 
to this this project, it obviously meant that I knew that they had been involved in illegal acts. So obviously I held information that the police obviously felt I could assist them with in their investigation. Do we, do we get enough? 250 quid for you? After unprecedented delays, the Crown Prosecution Service settled for a deal instead of a conviction. John Nation was found not guilty, but agreed to be bound over to keep the peace for a year. He's going to give that money towards the project, whereas the painter is going to want that money for themselves. There's been a, a substantial decrease in the amount of graffiti that has actually been, been made. Certain areas have been cleaned up and they haven't been marked up subsequently. Um, so yes, I think it was a success. That doesn't mean to say that, that we're complacent and it could uh, rear up again very quickly. But I, th I do believe that the people that were involved in it have had a sort of rather short, sharp shock in being caught and taken, taken to court. You could just drive the problem back out onto the street, which is what the police say they're actually trying to stop, the problem of graffiti aerosol art in the community. Well, if you take away the facility of the legal sites, which many of which have been organized by Barton Hill and John Nation, then you're right back to the start. But did the prosecution stop illegal work appearing? The work that appeared on the walls of this warehouse says not. Many of the convicted taggers and artists have reoffended, and new painters are replacing those who've given up illegal work. Both those who've gone straight and those who haven't say the intensity of the police operation has invigorated the illegal culture. They say that by being criminalized, it's been glamorized. Well, now there's more like, street tagging and stuff than there ever has been at any time before. I mean, if you just go and look at like, the bus stops and like, the buses that go past, you see that they're all plastic and stuff. But at the moment, people see Bristol as a, one of the top places just because of the big bus. And it's as if, like, the old place is really good for graffiti. If you've been busted, like, and so, like I said, it like, advertises the problem. It means that people are actually, there's like tourist attractions stuff for You get people actually coming to the area for the graffiti. The problem is, in many ways, a matter of a conflict between the criminal law authorities, the police uh, of various kinds, and youth. And this is a more general problem of policing of youth and youth culture across the country, which is often handled in a very heavy-handed way. And um, there are lots of other examples of this acid house movement at the moment, which has been policed with uh, a fairly strict legal clampdown. There's another example where you may well say that uh, hardline policing and hardline law and order policy has actually exacerbated the problem, not solved it. These officers at Tadworth Transport Police Headquarters near London are being taught Bristol fashion. The plainclothes instructor plays the part of an escaping tagger. Before you go on the platform, mm -hmm. um, you don't go right on trains. Just take your name. What did you have? Uh, trespass. That was all. When their training is complete and they've returned to their regions, the lessons of the Bristol operation will be nationally applied. The decision to create a national hardline policy on the policing of graffiti was taken at a seminar of senior officers after Operation Anderson. The more information you get from the House, the more information you can give to the local intelligence officer who can then circulate it. You may well have gone off the patch and gone elsewhere. You can check out the computer. That's the sort of stuff we're looking for. Not only when we search them at the scene, but later on, if you do get a chance to search the houses. What else would you be looking for then, maybe when you get to the house? Quite a lot of them um, also uh, have their tags and they, they do it in their own home as well, so you can marry up the tags. Um, I've seen a few. That's my name as well. Thank you. The reason the British Transport Police is able to transform regional experiments into national policies is because of its unique structure. Funded by the Home Office and British Rail, it only has one Chief Constable, 
and therefore only has one set of policies which can be quickly introduced and changed. Because those policies are national, they have a wide impact. They're often copied by other forces after being introduced by the transport police. Quite nice, some of them. I like that sort of thing. Um, so we put the, the information out then to, to Bristol, and to, to Cardiff, to Plymouth, various other places, and uh, they've all had successful operations there. Cardiff and South Wales had a substantial number in also. It all originated from the job at uh, Bristol. 